You've gone through Volcker, Greenspan, Bernanke, Yellen. When you heard this message from Jay Powell, what is your key takeaway? As dovish as the markets are interpreting it, Jay Jacob? Well, I think it was very sober, professional, and forward-looking. And I would say clarity was the key element there. The words were very clear. The economy is recovering, albeit in a somewhat uneven way. Durable goods are booming. Even inflation is now surpassing the objective of the Fed. So sounds like mission accomplished. Well, almost. The question is whether some temporary spikes in the inflation will remain temporary rather than be translated into permanent. And I think this is the issue, risk management. And the chairman, Paul, was very clear in saying we need to look into the medium term. We cannot leave the subject now of yes or no. He also drew a very sharp distinction between tapering in the sense of reducing the pace of asset purchases versus tapering in the sense of raising interest rates. We are not talking about okay. raising interest rates at this stage. It is just, in quotation mark, tapering the pace of purchasing the uh, assets. And it's very important because, you know, if you, all, if you look at uh, the type of okay. assets that have been purchased, the MBS, it will be very healthy to get them out okay. of them. So, Jacob, uh, also, as just the night before Jay Powell gave this very important speech, Bloomberg News reporting that the White House advisors are telling President Biden that he should reappoint Jay Powell to another four years as Fed chair. Should he? Is Jay Powell the right guy, or is it time to move on? Absolutely. It's really a no-brainer. There is no characteristic of chairman of the Federal Reserve that Jay Powell has not met successfully. He is very, very clear. He is disciplined. He is independent. He demonstrated that he, his capacity to stand under, to work under pressure. And let me tell you, uh, Jackson Hole is probably the most international uh, forum of the Federal Reserve, and it brings to it governors and, uh, and economists from all over the world. The standing that Jay Powell has in mm -hmm. the world is very, very significant. And I think okay. that at this stage, we need to reduce uncertainty and reappoint right. rather than create more noise. Jacob, how much are we underestimating the, the unknown eventualities because of the pandemic? Because we keep saying that this is an unprecedented disruption. Are there unexpected elements here that you think we're not perhaps modeling for? Well, it is indeed uh, unprecedented, and uh, especially with the unevenness of its impact, unevenness across sectors, unevenness across uh, population groups, and all in this kind of thing. And relative prices have changed significantly. However, let's not get confused. Monetary policy is an aggregative policy. It is not a sectoral policy. To me, this unevenness of the impact of the pandemics and the economy calls for a policy mix. We need to bring into the game the entire orchestra, fiscal policy, structural okay. policy, and monetary policy. policy. Monetary policy alone will not do it. We need to increase the flexibility okay. of the economic system. And systemic risks is another big concern. We saw the Bank of Korea moving last week, largely because of this worry over debt burdens. Is there a fear that the Fed and other central banks, other major Western central banks, might be behind the curve? Well, it is a serious matter. If you look at all the crises that have hit us in the past decades, the financial sector vulnerability has been the Achilles heel. I must say the banking sector now is much stronger than what it was in the previous crisis. But in the financial industry, there are still quite a few elements that okay. may create vulnerability. And so the aim of increasing resilience of the financial mm -hmm. sector is key. So, Jacob, um, when we look at inflation, is there a risk, speaking of risk, 
that the Fed waits too long, Jay Powell seems so convinced that this surge that many other Fed officials say is spreading out is not going to end soon. Supply constraints won't end soon. That that could be a wait that is too long. Patience that isn't warranted. Well, this is really a, a very, very central question. Because we are talking about risk management. Should we err on the conservative side or on the more easy side? We have had an extraordinary accommodative monetary policy now for many, many years, for very good reasons. But along the way, the system has accumulated huge amount of debt. And the system got used to cheap debt. Now, the question is, is the system ready to the world in which interest rates will start rising, or have they been so addicted to low-cost debt that it may create a disruption? It's essential to have this answer sooner okay. than later. Jacob, one final quick question. Uh, you mentioned tapering. You mentioned mortgage-backed securities. Do you get a sense there's a consensus at the Fed right now, or is that still a big debate, the pace? mortgage-backed securities versus treasuries, et cetera, and how important is this question? Uh, my guess is that uh, the consensus is building more than what uh, one would have expected earlier. You, you heard the reports of the various uh, governors and people who are voting in the next round. Tapering, namely cutting down the rate of purchase, is around the corner. I would say, starting with the MBS, it's a very important element. And nobody wants to wait much longer. So the debate is, is it September, is it October? And frankly, let me tell you, in a world in which communication is key and clarity lends credibility, it really won't matter much, as long as it is clear what the Fed is going to do. The issue is uh, not this year or next year, but rather this month or next month, and those are issues that in the macro context are less important as long as the clarity is in place.